Good afternoon and welcome to this lunch talk uh, hosted by the Center for Health and Wellbeing. My name is Gilbert Collins. I'm Director of Global Health Programs at Princeton University. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Vivian Lee for a talk this afternoon on lessons from the long fix using data and technology to improve healthcare. Let me give a bit of background um, for way of introduction about Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is the author of the acclaimed book, The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis with Strategies that Work for Everyone. A passionate champion of improving health in the US and worldwide, she works closely with Vera Lee's clinical and engineering teams to develop products and platforms that support the successful transformation of health systems to value and advance the co-production of health with patients, their caregivers, and communities. Dr. Lee serves as senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital, and is a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. She is the former Dean, Senior Vice President, and CEO of University of Utah Health, and is an MR radiologist who developed novel methods for measuring kidney function and vascular disease with MRI. Funded by the NIH for 20 years, Dr. Lee was elected to National Academy of Medicine in 2015. And in 2019, she received the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine's highest award for scientific contributions and leadership, the gold medal. She served on the NIH Council of Councils, advisory to the NIH director, and has authored over 200 peer reviewed research publications. Presently, she serves on the Defense Health Board advisory to the Department of Defense for Military Medicine, the Board of Directors of the Commonwealth Fund, and the Association of American Road Scholars, the Membership Committee of the National Academy of Medicine, and on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Lee is a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard Anthropologist, received a doctorate in medical engineering from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, earned her MD with honors from Harvard Medical School, and was valedictorian of her executive MBA program at NYU's Stern School of Business. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Lee. Let me turn it over to you. Terrific, thank you so much, uh, Gilbert. Thank you for having me here and it's really wonderful. I, I hope that one day we can be in person, but until then, I hope you all fare well. I am going to um, see if I can share my screen. Let's see. Do you think I can have um, permission to share the screen? And then I'm gonna share with you some slides. Um, as, as Professor Collins said, I just recently published this book, The Long Fix. And uh, one of my motivations for um, writing about The Long Fix was really to share with the broader public uh, many of the lessons that I've learned both from my own experiences leading in health systems, but really some wonderful stories from across the country and even the world about where people have done uh, really very innovative work to improve healthcare. Now, I think somebody might have to permission me in order to share, share my screen. Is that right? Because I'm not seeing it as a, let's see, maybe I can just give it to myself or no. I feel like you guys might have to grant me uh, so you should be the host of this meeting now, which means that you should be able to share your screen. Okay, let's try. Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. Can you guys see? Um, can you see the screen? Okay. I realize I'm not in present mode, uh, but that's only because once I go in present mode, then I can't really see, I can't see you all anymore. So, um, so I think all of us um, are, realize that uh, even before COVID, uh, our healthcare system in the US was facing some significant challenges and was underperforming. And I'm gonna talk about um, lessons from the long fix with respect to using data and technology to help improve our healthcare system. So most of us have seen data like this that compares the US with other high income nations around the world. And you all will know that we spend on average two, two and a half or three times as much as other countries. And despite spending that much more, we underperform on almost all measures of overall health of the population, whether it's infant mortality or maternal mortality, 
or in this case, life expectancy, where the average baby born today will live four or five or even six years less than the average baby born in say Japan or in Italy or Israel or Australia. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, we have just such an uneven spending of those healthcare dollars. And the biggest line between the haves and the have nots are those who have access to health insurance and those who don't. So even before the pandemic, uh, we had actually reached a low of about 10% of Americans who were uninsured. But with the pandemic, that number's increased and the Commonwealth Fund just issued, um, released their survey looking at whether Americans might be not only uninsured, but maybe underinsured or inadequately insured. And they found 43%, 43%, that's almost half of all Americans reported being um, unstably insured in the first half of 2020. Uh, unfortunately, we are not seeing the end yet of the COVID pandemic, although the news about the two vaccines is incredibly encouraging. Um, I included Italy on here because some days I wake up and think, can they be any worse in the US? But then I look to some of our European countries and I say, actually, it can be worse. So we really, we really need to do all we can to you know, protect each other with the mask and the social distancing and the hand washing. One of the silver linings of the COVID pandemic for me is the fact that I feel very proud of the profession that I'm in. I feel that doctors and nurses and um, respiratory therapists and everybody who's been on the front line has just uh, been, just demonstrated remarkable courage and dedication. And so part of the silver lining is that I think we are attracting some of the best and brightest young people, I hope, to our field. This is speaking as a former dean, you know, um, whether they're coming into medicine, coming into healthcare administration, coming into health policy, coming into research. Um, and I, I, I hope that that at least bodes well for the future. And what's not so positive is the impact of COVID on our economy and in turn, the implications of that on health since we spend so much on healthcare in this country. And here's some latest data from the CBO, their most recent projection, looking at the Medicare trust funds and you know, part A of Medicare. So Medicare, of course, is the program that pays for seniors in the US. And part A is the part that pays for hospital care, mostly comes out of our taxes. And unfortunately, what we're spending is exceeding what we are taking in. And originally the trust fund was, was projected to become insolvent by 2026, but you'll see here that the revised projections in the setting of COVID are that part A will become insolvent by 2024. So among all the things that Congress has to worry about, this new Congress, one of them is going to be how to deal with um, funding of healthcare. And one of my colleagues from the Commonwealth Fund, uh, Liz Fowler, who's been on the front lines of a lot of legislation said, you know, when you're talking about budget cuts, Congress takes a meat ax approach rather than a scalpel. It's gonna be across the board cuts, doesn't matter if you're a high quality provider or not. And, and of course that's the last thing we need right now. Um, and so it's incumbent upon us within healthcare, within health policy to advocate for and to really um, implement the solutions that we need to be seen, that we need to see across the country. Really take that scalpel to the waste and the inefficiencies and the administrative costs and not, not the blunt force approach. And now the good news is that when you talk to people who have been in healthcare for a long time, and I interviewed more than 100 people for the book, for example, but just, you know, talking to all of my colleagues who've been, you know, we've all grown up in healthcare, what's the one thing you would change in the U.S. healthcare system? The vast majority of them say it's our business model. It's how we pay for healthcare. Instead of a fee-for-service model, we need to move to paying for better health and better outcomes. And that means that we need to make a significant change in, our, in the way in which we do work, where in fee-for-service, the more we do to people, the more money we make. In a value-based system, actually, maybe we don't even want them in the hospital because we want them to be healthy and stay out of the hospital. It's a completely different way of running the business. And so I wanted to um, share an example of how the country is moving towards this more value-based system and maybe just read a, a short section from my book um, about uh, Chen Men. Chen Med is a, a medical group that uh, now has, I think, 50 or 60 offices all over the country. 
And I'm talking to Chris Chen, who is the CEO of Chen Med, and he's talking about his dad who, who started this practice. Starts with a quote, go see that crazy Chinese doctor who takes care of all the poor Cubans. Chris Chen grins as he tells me how people used to rave about his father's clinic in Miami. His father had started as a typical primary care doctor in private practice. He was paid fee for service, which meant the more patients he saw, the more he earned. Then in South Florida in the early 1990s, a few insurance companies started experimenting with new ways to pay doctors. Instead of fee for service, they gave them a fixed amount per patient each year. If a patient needed expensive imaging, costly drugs, or a long hospitalization that added up to more than that amount, it was the doctor's problem. Chris's dad, the doctor, and mom, the office manager, experimented in this new model. They welcomed referrals, but other doctors sent them only their frailest and poorest patients, the ones they knew would be grossly unprofitable under this new way of paying. That's how Chris's parents began with 250 of the sickest people in Miami, people who would have been almost impossible to keep well at any facility at any price. It looked as if the chance had signed up for a financial suicide mission. Because resources were scarce and their patients' needs were many, the Chens decided to focus on primary care and prevention. Their fragile elderly patients had to be seen frequently by doctors. Once they got sick, it would be too late. So they set up monthly visits, even if there was nothing wrong. Getting to the clinic would be tough for many of them, so the Chens provided free door-to-door -door transportation. They worked out that averting the cost of just one ambulance ride and hospital stay could pay for a year of shuttle service. They opened a pharmacy in the clinic so their patients could conveniently, cheaply, and reliably fill prescriptions. And since their patients often had complex needs, physicians in the clinics conferred several times a week about how best to treat those who weren't doing well. Somehow, that crazy Chinese doctor and his wife not only provided outstanding care for their patients, including many who often didn't have enough to cover copays or deductibles, but they also managed to make them healthier. They reduced hospitalizations. And even more amazingly, they broke even financially. Out of desperation, the Chens invented a better way to do healthcare. This model that I've just described for you is now called Medicare Advantage. So it's actually uh, about a third of all patients with Medicare are a part of Medicare Advantage and it's one of the fastest growing programs. And it's an example of moving from fee for service where we get paid for seeing every patient to a value-based model where we pay the physicians a fixed amount of money and they're expected to keep people healthy. And by keeping them out of the hospital, you know, especially seniors who do not usually do that well in hospitals, especially the frail elderly, uh, it's just a better way of caring for people. And it's also more robust in, in following up with uh, the Chen Meds of the world and Iora Health and Presby and these different health systems. I've, I've been following up with them during COVID. It's actually shown that they're much more resilient in the face of a pandemic because in a fee-for-service model, if you don't get those fees, if you're not doing things to people, you end up shutting down. Like so many clinics have had to furlough doctors and nurses, whereas Chen Med is able to keep going and use those dollars to care for their patients at home. So it's been a very, very interesting set of lessons. So that's an example. And, and that's just one example that I share in the book, really, which is about what is this new way of healthcare look like across the whole system? So I've already shown you how it's already happening now across the country in, in Chen Med practices. Um, what would value-based care look like for patients, for us as individuals, as family members? And some of those lessons are that, you know, we're all paying for healthcare. Even if we have insurance, it's still coming out of our paychecks indirectly. And so we need to be more responsible. You know, not every kid with a cold needs to get the antibiotics. We don't always have to have an MRI if we have some back pain, for example. There are things that we should do. Of course, what clinicians and healthcare systems need to do, whether it's safety, technology, learning health systems, patient satisfaction. And then what about other industries? You know, what's the role of pharmaceutical companies and big data? What if we paid for drugs and price them based on how cost effective they were. Um, and then what's the role of payers? You know, they, there's a huge uh, section on employers. Employers cover healthcare for half of Americans. I have a 10 point action plan for how employers can um, get back control of the healthcare of their employees. And then uh, a chapter on government run healthcare. And I focus actually on the military health system 
Um, I serve on that Defense Health Board advisory to the DOD, and it's, it's a really, really interesting system for understanding how we can keep costs down and yet take uh, pretty good care of folks anyway. And then weaving that all together into some policy. So that, that's kind of how the whole book lays out. And what I wanted to do today um, was to talk a little bit more about engaging physicians in change, engaging patients in change, and both of these using technologies. And then I have a very short vignette at the end on global, uh, global, global public health project outside of COVID. Um, so let's see if I can manage to do this in the time that we have. So the first is, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about engaging physicians in the change. And I'll, I'll probably try to be a little briefer on this, given, given this audience. But I, I start with Ernest Amory Codman, who um, is a really interesting character. And actually, by the way, I, I forgot to say this earlier, but if you don't mind in the chat, just introducing yourself and saying who you are and maybe what your background is, I'm always curious about who is in, in health policy and global health and health care just generally interested, you know, just feel free to share that in the chat. Um, Codman was a physician around the turn of the last century. And what was notable about him, he was uh, a surgeon at the Mass General, just at a time when there were a lot of firsts and the learning curve was really steep. And he believed in this idea of the end results, that every patient had an index card in his, that he kept in his pocket, and he would write down the key things about that patient, what he thought the diagnosis was when they came in, what he found in the operating room if he operated on them, what happened to them afterwards, what happened to them a year later. And these end results cards were the way that he believed all doctors and clinicians should learn from their patients and get better and better. And he believed that they should be actually made public, that the public should decide where to, to go for care. And doctors should get promoted. Faculty at the Harvard Medical School should get promoted based on their end results. It's so commonsensical. Uh, he's sort of my hero, but it was really radical and bold and mostly, um, mostly rejected actually at the time. So he left the Mass General, left Harvard Medical School where he was on faculty, started his own hospital called the End Results Hospital. And actually after the first five years, he actually published the results of every patient and had about a 30% error rate. Um, not just him, but also the other surgeons, including Harvey Cushing, who's the, one of the founders of neurosurgery. And so now we are in the modern day, the question is how can we do the same kind of learning? How can we actually improve outcomes um, using the same kind of strategy? And just taking a book from you know, a change management course from business school, uh, we set out to do this back when I was at the University of Utah and there are hospitals all over the country that are working on this now. And really I wanna call out the key components, data, using data to engage doctors and then using the data to really empower them. And we need new kinds of data because in the old fever service model, we had all kinds of data. It was just measuring how much are we doing to people? And now we need measurements of, are we keeping people healthy? Are we keeping the people out of the hospital? And that actually requires, requires new work. And so here, when we talk about moving to value, we think about it as a service component. There's patient satisfaction, which is very important, patient engagement, quality, and cost. And when we talk about quality, sometimes it's difficult to get a lot of clinician buy-in because the measurements are often um, kind of frustrating. Like, you know, we care about whether you have prevented a urinary tract infection in a patient if you're a surgeon, but we don't really measure you by whether you cured the patient with that operation. It's a little bit funny. So I'm, what I'm showing you here is an initiative around engaging physicians in that change because the surgeons were complaining about the quality measures. And so we said to them, well, tell us what you think perfect care should look like. And so this is a perfect care dashboard that they created for patients who are getting hip replacements and knee replacements. And some of these measures hospital acquired conditions, patient safety measures. These are standard measurements that we have to report on. They added two. One is early mobility that everybody needs to get up and out of bed the day of surgery. The anesthesia is still working, so it's not as bad as it sounds, but it's known to help those patients recover faster. And admit to OTSS, which means go to the orthopedic and trauma surgery service instead of overflowing onto a general surgery floor, for example, which, um, which they don't think. Uh, offered his good care. And so I'll just tell you a quick story on early mobility. Once we started measuring this, we found out that a bunch of patients were not 
um, getting physical therapy on the night after they had the operation. And it was because they were the last case of the day. By the time they got to the floor, the physical therapist had already gone home. And so that's why they weren't getting up and out of bed. So we just adjusted some physical therapists, the shifts, so that they came in later and they were able to work with these patients. And then we were able to achieve 100% um, mobility and that measurably uh, improved outcomes, lowered the length of stay, reduced complications. We actually published this in JAMA a couple of years ago. And we're not the only ones to engage our doctors in asking them to help define um, perfect care or Geisinger calls it proven care or at Mayo, they call the physicians and clinicians the experts. Um, but this engagement is very, very important in part of the change. And once the physicians started thinking this way, they actually started moving towards engaging patients in that discussion as well. So it was a very important first step. Um, then the holy grail of where we went to was on costs of care. And I'm just keeping an eye on time and I'm, I probably won't read you this section from the book, even though it's really one of my favorite sections. But the gist of it is that um, in thinking about costs, one of the best kept dirty little secrets of healthcare is that most of us in healthcare who are practicing medicine don't actually know what it costs for us to run the business, at least at the level of caring for each patient. Um, and when I'm saying cost here, I'm talking about what it costs us to run the business, not what we're gonna bill or charge, but how much does it cost us to take care of a patient with pneumonia or to administer the flu vaccine or hopefully soon the COVID vaccine um, or to do an MRI? Uh, really very few people in this country know. The CFO knows how much it costs to run the whole business, but we as individual doctors and nurses, we don't know what it costs us to care for each patient. And so it's really no wonder that our costs are out of control. It's like going to the grocery store and shopping and not having a single price tag on a single item and then wondering why you exceeded your budget at the end of the day. So we set out to do that um, when I was at the University of Utah and we actually costed everything out. Here's an example of costing out uh, a patient with appendicitis. And we looked through and we worked out each of the costs for each of the components. And we found that there was a lot of variability in the overall cost for people who had a total knee replacement. And just by measuring it, when we could see the variability and see the causes of variability, it really drove the physicians to work together to try to improve and to try to get better. No one wanted to be the highest cost clinician. Everybody wants to have the best outcomes and all this variation really reduces outcomes. So we were able to improve the perfect care index and um, reduce the cost of care. And by reducing the cost of care, we were actually able to take those savings. Those savings for inpatient care just fell straight to our bottom line. And actually our overall margin in the hospital, which is shown here in purple, increased from around four and a half percent to uh, about 10%. Uh, at the same time, the numbers in orange are our quality rankings among all university health systems. So we were able to show that through this kind of initiative, we were able to do good and to do well. And now we've moved beyond that, um, that kind of tool at Verily now to take in also some artificial intelligence tools to help the surgeons practice and learn in the operating room. And that's just taking this whole uh, learning health system just one step further. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes now talking about, I've talked about health systems. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about engaging patients with digital technologies. And of course, the COVID pandemic has really uh, drawn our attention to all of the people who have chronic diseases who are most susceptible to COVID and most afraid of coming into the clinic. And what we've seen, again, I, I'm going to skip a reading now, but I'm going to I'm gonna um, tell you that I do talk a lot about this idea of co-producing health and how digital technologies can help patients and clinicians co-produce their health together. One key factor there is just being able to communicate and tele telehealth has just taken off, um, broken down all these barriers that have been there for decades, just literally overnight with uh, the COVID pandemic. But just seeing people and talking to people over the video conference isn't really enough. We need other technologies to help measure their health and to measure their disease and their body's physiology. 
And so here are some examples. Uh, Lavango, Verdo, Mata are in the diabetes space, for example, Ginger, Talkspace, MoodFit in the psychiatric mental well being. I'm going to share with you uh, an example from our own uh, business at Verily, which is on Duo. And this is started as a virtual diabetes clinic and now cares for people with hypertension and others. And it's very similar to the other technologies. And this idea of co producing health. I think is exemplified um, in the way in which the technology works. So we have a continuous glucose monitor and I'm showing that here. It's the size of a key fob and it goes on your arm or your abdomen and it measures your blood sugar 24 seven. So instead of having to prick your finger to check your blood, to get the drop of blood, to check your blood sugars as a person with diabetes, now with the Dexcom or with another, you know, there are other ones of these as well. Uh, we happen to work with Dexcom to make this one, but there are others as well in the market. You can see on the map app, the blood sugar tracing, and then you take pictures of your meals and snacks. And for the first time, you can actually make an association between what you're eating and what it's doing to your blood sugar or how you're sleeping or how you're exercising, just your life and what it's doing to your blood sugars. It's, it's completely transformative to people's experiences. And you may not need artificial intelligence to tell you that maybe that breakfast biscuit wasn't the best choice, um, but sometimes the AI is really helpful. You know, For example, advising you on um, a bowl of oatmeal might be better or maybe not as good as say a couple of eggs or soy milk might be better for you than your friend uh, than skim milk, but for your friend, maybe skim milk is better for example. Um, so the AI is very helpful. And then of course you have the telehealth piece. You can chat with a coach, you can video conference with a physician. And when you put this whole thing together, you're really now talking about co-producing health. You're really engaging people in their own health, in their own bodies, in ways that's just so much powerful, more powerful than lecturing at them saying, you know, you ought to do this better. And so we and others, all of the companies that I've shown you have seen very consistent results that we have better glycemic control. People have better control of their blood sugars with this kind of technology. And given that 30% of overall health is determined by health behaviors, I think you get us feeling for why I think the whole world is pretty bullish about digital health technologies. And typically, uh, if, if we were in person or we had a little longer time, I'd, I'd be asking you, you know, have you tried any digital health apps? Have you tried Fitbits? Have you tried, you know, mindfulness? Because if you haven't, really encourage you to try these. These are going to become a part of our armamentarium. You know, they're going to be a part of, of normal care. I'm going to spend the last, I I'm wanted to finish pretty soon, but let me just spend like two or three minutes telling you this one little vignette. This is the last part of uh, my presentation. And I pulled this because I know this is a global, some of you are interested in global public health. And this is work that we're doing at Verily. And it's not COVID. Um, many of us, I think, are saturated with COVID news. This is about other very important infectious global health diseases, um, yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, for example, that are transmitted by Aedes aegypti, this uh, mosquito. And Aedes aegypti is endemic only to a small part of Africa and it's become invasive around the world, spreading all these infectious diseases. And so we, together with many other, you know, global public health entities have been trying to eradicate Aedes aegypti. It was actually brought out through the, through the slave trade, interestingly. Um, so we wanna, we wanna eradicate this. Interestingly, um, the way to do it, uh, this is one we've adopted from, uh, from others, is that the males who are treated with a bacteria called Wolbachia, which is one of the most prevalent bacteria in the animal kingdom and in most insects actually, but it's not in, in Aedes aegypti. But if you put it in Aedes aegypti in the males, uh, then when they mate, the, the eggs don't hatch. So they're essentially sterile. And uh, another fact about mosquitoes, you may or may not know this, is that only the females bite. So if we're gonna do this, we wanna just release the males. So we used a lot of our technology in South San Francisco to, um, create this large facility. I have a picture of it here, our big robots, um, and used a lot of AI in this process to optimize um, and, for example, to sort, sort the males from the females based on their different um, antenna and their body shape and so on, so that we could just release the males. And we've been doing this for several years, started in Fresno, California, with all the right authorities approving, don't worry. And you can see here in blue, kind of just really suppression of these mosquitoes with this technique. And we've now been partnering 
with multiple countries around the world. Here are some of the earliest partners that we've had, really places that are significantly affected by these diseases. And just, you know, I'm really excited about another, being able to show another example of technology in, in global health, public health um, and the huge potential for reducing morbidity and mortality globally through prevention, which is of course what we really all should be focused on. Um, okay, so with that, I hope I've given you a flavor for some of the technologies that we can adapt for physicians in measuring value in order to move our healthcare system for patients and co-producing their health, and then our vignette on um, Aedes aegypti and global public health. So with that, um, I will stop sharing and um, am happy to maybe um, take a few questions here as we round out the, round out the hour. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for that very, very informative presentation. We do have about 10 minutes for Q&A from the audience. So you are welcome to submit questions in the chat. We'll take them from there. Also, um, if you want to try uh, raising your hand um, and offering content or some questions from the, uh, the video, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, do keep in mind that this session is being recorded in advance. Um, but okay. let me... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I was looking at some of the comments Some people have sent me some to everyone and some privately. And I should say that um, one of the target audiences, several of the people who have reached out are actually undergraduates, which is wonderful. I didn't realize there were going to be undergraduates today. So that's terrific. Um, and you are actually one of my target audiences, because when I wrote this book, I wanted, uh, I actually wanted to write down about all the things that I wish I'd known before I actually gone into healthcare, you know, like how does this whole thing actually really work? And so I just want to mention that I'm doing an event, um, one of these, you know, Zoomy type things on um, December 3rd, just for pre-meds. So um, for those of you who are interested, um, I don't know if we've posted it on my website yet or not, Vivian Lee MD. Um, but if not, you can go there and just ping me or check it out. It's going to be December 3rd for pre-meds, just since I saw a bunch of pre-meds on the list. So I just had to share that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so let me start by asking a question. Um, I was very interested in a lot of what you said. And uh, one of the many things was your comments on physician knowledge of cost of care and cost of treatments and interventions and how that uh, impacted not only lowered uh, the cost of care. I was interested in knowing your thoughts on the mechanism by which that happened. So is it essentially that if the physician became aware that a particular procedure was expensive, they were given some sort of personal incentive or maybe social sanction to say, for example, I don't wanna be the most expensive high cost provider in our group or in our unit. And so they, they had some incentive to either not offer certain expensive treatments or discourage patients from taking them? How exactly did it work to let physicians know the cost and have that lead to lower, all, lower overall costs? So great question. So the, the tool um, that we built in Utah and that we've now built in the company is really, uh, most physicians are primarily concerned about patient outcomes and not the cost of care, right? We're here to make people better. And there's a reason why we don't look at cost because we don't, we don't want to be viewed as people who would somehow, because we're penny pinching something, we're not going to provide the best care. So everything that I showed you um, together with the costing data also has a patient outcomes uh, data as well. And when you put the two together, what you see is that our, the way in which we practice medicine is highly variable. Like no two doctors seem to do the same thing, even though there are a lot of guidelines, but because we train through an apprenticeship program, we might've trained at, at uh, we might've trained in, um, in, at Princeton doesn't really have a medical school, but we might've trained in, you know, in Boston or we might've trained at the Mayo Clinic or in Oklahoma or wherever. And that's the reason why we do things the way we do it. So once we showed people all the variability, um, what happened was uh, the teams actually got together to look at how they were caring for people. So for example, on the total joint replacements, we found that the artificial hips that people were using, there was a three fold variation in costs threefold difference in cost of those hips. 
And yet when we look at the outcomes, there was actually no difference whatsoever. So there was a lot of peer pressure amongst them to say, well, you know, do you really need to use the hip that costs three times as much? You're, you're like, because if you actually could convert to the lower cost hip, um, you know, we'd be saving a lot of money for the, for the institution and that money could be used for research, for training, for whatever. So it, it played out a couple of different ways. Like in that particular example, the first step they did was they went to the vendor and they said, you know, the person who, the manufacturer of those hips, and they said, what are you doing? How come you're making me look so bad? Why is this hip that I'm using three times as much as my buddies? Come on. So they actually applied some pressure that way, which was helpful. And in other cases, they actually did make changes. Um, the financial arrangement we, we created was that we were shared, we shared the savings with the departments and the divisions. You could not use it for compensation for yourself. That's totally a no-no. But you could use the money, for example, to um, hire a research assistant. A bunch of people actually used it to do more quality improvement research and to, for example, fund travel to meetings and to um, support uh, their postdocs or, or residents and fellows who were doing research. So that's actually how it played out. All right. Thanks. I have something that I'd like you to react to a little bit from the, the chat. Um, so Mitch Kleiman asked a question, five years from now, how much of an impact do you think payment reform, pay for value and outcomes will truly make? I worked with hospitals and doctors 30 years ago on uh, capitation and package pricing, and it hasn't seemed to advance. The problem seems on measuring quality in a convincing way. What am I missing? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is the question. We've been talking about payment reform for a long time in this country. And uh, I think really there, there are two points that I wanna make about this. One, that I do think that COVID is just, we were already hitting the tipping point. The Affordable Care Act, uh, Secretary Burwell, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Obama, actually was incredibly effective in declaring a deadline. She like just put a stake in the ground and said, Medicare, which is you know our biggest payer and we have to pay attention to whatever Medicare does. Medicare is going to have 75%, 50 you know, she had these different criteria of the dollars that Medicare was gonna pay out only in value-based models. And when she did that, it really was, you know, most of us in healthcare, we were sort of kind of coasting along, not exactly sure, you know, when the change was going to happen. But once that happened, then the private insurers started speaking out, then it really did happen that we, it really did happen that we all started to move our system. Um, the current administration has continued, but it hasn't been probably as aggressive about the deadline, um, but it has also continued to embrace value. The, the one thing about value, it is, it is bipartisan, you know, Romney Care, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, it, it's, it's all kind of part of the same effort. And so this is, that's the one good thing about it. Um, so I think five years from now, actually, we will see significant payment reform because we are at this tipping point. We are, we are facing this crisis, which is that, like I showed you, the Medicare trust fund is running out of money. We're adding trillions of dollars to our deficit. We have all these people who are uninsured and unstably insured because of unstable employment. We are at, I mean, look at the health equity and disparities issues and how that's playing out in COVID. There are so many burning fires. It's not smoldering embers anymore uh, that I think we, we really have to move forward. And the health systems actually have an appetite. Like everyone has an appetite for change now that I've never seen before. We have the hospitals that are now saying, you know what, I would welcome a global payment model. Never would have heard that five or 10 years ago. They never would have said, oh, just pay me a fixed amount. Don't do the fee for service thing anymore. But now having gone through and almost on the teetered on the bank of, uh, uh, on the brink of bankruptcy through COVID, you know, with shut down hospitals and clinics, now all of a sudden, oh, that money actually looks pretty good. That stability would actually be valuable to us. So I'm actually much more optimistic in a, in a kind of an unfortunate way because it's because we're on a crisis, but I actually think that uh, we are gonna see significant payment reform in the next five years. Okay, hopefully so. Um, I will leave to the audience to read a comment from Robert. It's been more of a reflection than a question. I do wanna pose a question from Nathan, an undergrad at Princeton, a senior. He says, I have definitely been seeing a lot of excitement on health behavior modifying apps and technology side 
but I don't see that same adoption among the population at large. Do you think lack of brand backing, privacy concerns, efficacy, authority, or something else might be driving this gap? Yeah, so I think we're just in the infancy of the uh, digital health, digital app space. Uh, I know we're at the infancy of it, um, which is why I encourage people like Nathan to understand it and to use them and kind of be a part of that trajectory as we scale the learning curve. Uh, there are a number of things that are limiting it right now, but first we're just really, really early. There's um, not one, one limitation has been the inability of these digital health apps to interconnect with electronic medical records a problem that's called interoperability. We refer to it as interoperability and that, that the, some of those barriers are starting to come down. So we'll see in the next few years that that will be a significant improvement. Right now, they kind of live in their own little separate worlds, digital health data, and then you go in the hospital or you go to your clinic and they have different sets of data. So those have to connect for this to really take on, take off. And then we also have issues with, um, have we really shown the efficacy of these? enough to warrant reimbursement by the insurance companies. And so there, of course, that's happening gradually. It's actually been accelerated for diabetes, for example. Medicare has now agreed to pay for the continuous glucose monitors um, since COVID. So some of that um, evidence generation, showing the technology works, um, convincing the payers and getting the right payment model, and then sharing the data, those are all hurdles right now, but we'll, we'll overcome those. Um, and the market will get much more sophisticated in terms of all the kinds of sensors that are going to be available. And, and then we as, as patients and individuals are also going to get more sophisticated about how to use these. And then finally, there's the whole broadband issue. You know, obviously we need to ensure that the whole country has access to, to the smartphone technology and ensuring that these aren't uh, priced so high that, um, that people can't afford them. So, so these are all, all barriers right now, but they're all, in my view, all surmountable. And that's part of the reason why I'm in tech is because I really wanna help, help overcome those. Wonderful. Um, I know we're up against the hour. I did wanna give you one last question for those that are able to stay. Um, it's on the politics of the solutions, I guess, at our public policy school under which our center is a part, um, people often, often emphasize the difference between um, politics and policy, and you could have well-crafted policies, um, which you presented today, um, but it's a different issue making that into reality um, and shepherding that into being. And so the last question from Karen is, pharmaceutical companies spend million dollars to lobby for healthcare policy in Congress to benefit them. Where do you see healthcare changes come from now? From Congress, by high-tech companies, or by citizens. So essentially, what do you see the role of these different parties in actually making into reality um, a transition from, say, fee for service to value-based healthcare? Um, uh, yeah, in negative one minutes, um, I think that the I, this is exactly what I'm uh, this is exactly what, what I'm writing about in this book, which is that you have to have the pairs, the clinicians and the patients individually all have a significant role to play in this. No one entity um, is going to be able to, it's like the three legs of the three-legged stool. So you need the payers, you need Medicare and the other insurance companies to say, we only wanna pay for better health and better health outcomes with the new payment models. You need clinicians who are gonna embrace that and have the tools to be successful. And then you need individuals to engage in their own health. I mean, look at COVID. You can have all of the science in the world, but if people don't mask, we're on our third peak. So you need all three pieces. And that's really, you know, the sort of, that's why I have an action plan at the end of every chapter. It's like, this is what each one of us has to do in our different roles. It's all of our problem. It's our future. So we all have to do something about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. And on that note, we'll wrap things up. Thank um, you. As many of you will have seen in the chat, we've provided a link to Dr. Lee's book um, on Amazon. So you're more than welcome to get a copy and learn more about this, tell your friends as well. Um, but Dr. Lee, thank you so much for agreeing to join us um, today. And we wish you the best as you continue your research. Great, appreciate it. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>